Hi, everyone. My name is Elizabeth Edwards. Uh, I'm a professor in the Department of Chemical Engineering and Applied Chemistry at the University of Toronto. And I'm very pleased to be here. I had a lovely lunch with Nathan. And I've, I'm relatively new to the mining business. But I have been working in subsurface uh, bioremediation and remediation for more than 20 years. And so I've worked with a lot of um, oil companies and um, uh, consultants on the remediation side and the groundwater remediation side, but not so much in the, in the, in, in the mineral mining side. And what I'd like to tell you, introduce to you a little bit is about the fascinating world of microorganisms and their diversity and why uh, it's really fun to work at the intersection of the, the biogeochemistry or the, bio, the chemistry, the biology, the physics, and to try and solve problems that we have, and, and, and largely cleaning up water. And so um, I, I thought we'd start by, so uh, Leslie and I are going to give this tag team kind of talk, and I'm going to start with sort of an overview of the of the microbial world and, and, and some of the drivers and some of the, an example from the bioremediation side of things where it's been, uh, we've been able to translate technology into practice. And then uh, I'll hand it over to Leslie. And so um, just to get us all on familiar footing, um, we've all heard of Charles Darwin and the notion that the environment selects, so that the, shape, the organisms adapt and evolve to the environment that they live in, so with what types of seeds they're eating, the shape of the beak would change. And this concept of a phylogenetic tree, which Charles Darwin drew, uh, where organisms kind of evolve from a common ancestor and diverge and to occupy sort of all available niches on the planet. Okay? And so this is true for birds and it's true for all kinds of organisms. In the past, we had a view of life on the planet that was kind of divided into animals and plants and then small things called the protists. Okay? And these small things were, so the plants and animals is what you could see and, and lots of cataloging went on about all that. And at the very root of this tree is the idea that we all evolved from a common ancestor, a common primordial cell at some point. And, and the, the roles of microorganisms are really very uh, understated in these early trees. Okay? And one of the big, big changes that has occurred uh, really over the last 50 years since DNA uh, has been un uh, appreciated is that this view of the microbial world is, is not really entirely correct. And so if we think about DNA, all one thing that's common to all cells, and one of the reasons why we, we're pretty sure we all evolved from a common ancestor is that the DNA is the same regardless of what living creature you are. The chemistry that governs it, the way it gets replicated, all of this is exactly the same, that bio biochemistry. And so DNA is a very simple molecule with these three, cha uh, four changing bases, and the sequence um, evolves and uh, codes for all the, the machines in our cells, all the proteins in our cells. And so by analyzing sections of the DNA of all of living cells, um, uh, researchers started to create paint a very different picture of the tree of life. And the tree of life now looks like something like this, where you have um, the things that you recognize are really up here. Animals, plants, and the small things okay, are all clumped together in one side. And this is just looking at the difference in the sequences of A's and T's and G's and C's in the DNA of all of these different cells. And so uh, you know, what, we, what, what we see here is that the larger macroorganisms all clump together in this evolutionary tree. The origin of life would be somewhere here and has diverged over, over billions of years. And so all of these purple and red branches here occupy uh, the microbial world or, or represent the microbial world. And all the things that we see, the animals and fungi, are really over on this side. And what this tree really reflects is not so much diversity of, of appearance, like cows look very different from people, look very different from plants, but diversity of metabolism, <coughs> diversity of chemistry, okay, and how they process uh, the environment around, around and act on the environment around and extract energy from the uh, environment around. And so uh, all of these organisms at this end breathe oxygen and uh, have a very similar metabolism, essentially. Okay, that's the way you could think about it. And so the person who came up with this, the other thing about this tree of life is there is this branch here, <laughs> which we call the eukarya, the, which you means true, karya means nucleus. So, so for those of you who can remember back to biology ages ago, cells have a, cells have a nucleus, at least some cells do. So that's these, this group here. And all of these 
Organisms of this side are called the prokaryotes that don't really have a nucleus. They actually are a more simple cell. Okay? And what's interesting is that we think of you know, bacteria like E. coli, which would fall in this branch here. But what Carl Woese proposed back in 1977, and when he proposed it, it was a heretic concept, was that there was actually another, the, 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 the way the tree should be divided is into these three kingdoms. And there's actually a huge other kingdom that we had never considered before that he called the archaea because the organisms within it are salt-loving or thermophilic or produce methane, and they hearkened back to an ancient planet, and so he called them that. Uh, and so that, that those organisms that were in this group here were as different from the typical bacteria that we think of, like E. coli, than they were from animals and plants and things like that. And so it deserved to have its own kingdom. So he first proposed this three kingdoms of life in 1977. And there's a nice quote uh, that he has here, which is that imagine walking in the countryside and not being able to tell a snake from a cow, from a mouse, from a blade of grass. And so when you think about the microbial world and we walk around and all we see are these tiny single cell organisms and they all look about the same and you can't tell one from the other from the other, but they are way more different even than a cow is from a blade of grass. Okay. And so there's this huge diversity that uh, only in the last 50 years has it been begun to be appreciated and only really more recently with the advent of highly uh, high throughput sequencing technology of DNA that is uh, have we been really been able to appreciate the diversity of the microbial world uh, and so this is just to to say that these are all the microbes occupy all this distance so the length of these lines is the evolutionary distance is proportional to the evolutionary distance so all plants just fall on one branch. All animals, everything that you can see, just falls on one branch. Um, and so there's been a lot of uh, press about this uh, microbial diversity and, and all the different ecosystem functions that the microbes play in, in cycling every single element on the planet. Okay? And so when, uh, when you go down deep in the ocean, you find all kinds of new microbes. And when you go any environment you look into, you find new microbes. And so there's been papers that say uh, that, you know, that the diversities, the numbers of organisms we estimated you know, 10 years ago is wrong. It's actually 10 times higher or 100 times higher. And then moreover, if you look at all the microbes on the planet and at how much depth that microbes actually exist, and if you integrate that over the, the, the surface of the planet, uh, and make some assumptions, the mass of microbes is actually greater than all of the tropical forests on the, on the planet. So the biomass, it makes up the, the greatest biomass on Earth. Uh, we also know more personally that our, we're all full of microbes and, uh, and that actually we have more microbial cells on our body than we do have human cells. Uh, and so these kinds of facts are, are interesting. Maybe I won't mention the second one at lunchtime. <laughs> Um, and, so, and so what are all these microbes doing and, and, and how are, I mean, obviously the microbes in our gut, I mean, you've heard it in the, pa in, in the in newspapers and so on, that the microorganisms in our bodies protect us from all kinds of pathogens, uh, you know, that they help us digest our food, they provide vitamins, interesting microorganisms, for example, are the only things that can make vitamin B12, and yet every cell on the planet d d depends on vitamin B12. It's only made by microorganisms, things like this. So there's um, a, a, a remarkable um, capability uh, in, in, in the microbial cells. And so if we think about all cells and all of us on the planet, we all need something to eat and something to breathe. Okay? And uh, we're having lunch and we're breathing oxygen. And so our lunch is a relatively reduced compound and these get oxidized and we exhale CO2 and we breathe oxygen and it gets reduced to water. And this redox reaction, the simple redox reaction, releases energy. And our cells capture that energy, store it in the form of ATP, and then allows us to move and do all these other things. Okay? So microorganisms do exactly the same thing. And many microorganisms grow really lovely, really well on sugars, and, and you have to grow them in a dish, in a Petri dish, or in a shake flask, and you're adding oxygen, or in a wastewater treatment plant. We're adding oxygen so that it can degrade the compounds in the wastewater, and, and this is how it happens. Okay? But microorganisms can use all kinds of things. I've looked a lot, worked a lot on hydrocarbon remediation. So microorganisms can actually use toluene and xylenes and benzenes and even hydrogen as these reduced compounds, electron donors in metabolism, coupled to oxygen, 
coupled to other electron acceptors. So you can have nitrate reduction to nitrogen gas, so that's a process called denitrification, sulfate reduction to H2S, iron 3 reduction to iron 2, CO2 reduction to methane in methanogenesis. And so as long as the delta G, as long as the redox reaction gives you a negative delta G under the conditions that the microbes are living, not at standard conditions, but under the conditions that the microbes are living, then these microorganisms can get, can eke out in existence. Okay, and that's why there's such a huge diversity, because there are so many potential gradients out in the environment, and, 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 and microorganisms will adapt to use these. And so I have a little video. Hopefully the sound will come through. I'll turn my sound up maybe. Uh, this is from a production from the American Society for Microbiology. So Carl Stetter is a pioneer micro, uh, microbiologist. Uh, this was 20, uh, 1999 this video was taken actually, so, but he's still active and has done a lot of work on hyperthermophiles, which are organisms that live at, in boiling water, and he's done a lot of work on, on organisms that um, metabolize sulfur in various ways as well, which is very relevant to mining processes, needless to say. And so this is one of my favorite, favorite figures. It comes out of a, a textbook, actually, in microbiology, environmental microbiology. And, and so what we've got here is a clock, okay, that, that starts here, actually, origins of the Earth at 4.6 billion years ago, and then all the way to the present, okay. And so it, it, the earliest evidence that life might have begun maybe uh, 3.8 billion years ago at this point, and so that's where bacteria might have evol uh, first evolved. And then, and that, that, that time, the Earth was anoxic and uh, um, hydrogen and ammonia and, and nitrogen and CO2, that kind of thing's in the atmosphere. And then, so the, the early bacteria used, used these kinds of elements in their metabolism, or they used light, so like photosynthesis, like plants, but anoxically. In other words, they weren't, uh, they weren't aerobic and they weren't breathing oxygen at the time. And only when the cyanobacteria, the first evidence of cyanobacteria is somewhere in this window here, where these produce oxygen as a byproduct of, of photosynthesis, that the Earth slowly began to become oxygenated. And it wasn't until way up here that the Earth became as oxygenated, 20% oxygen in the atmosphere. And so um, the, first, the first eukaryotes, meaning that third branch of life, only started at this point here, started to get algae here. The big first macroorganisms and plants and mammals and stuff showed up only once there was enough oxygen in the atmosphere to kind of support that metabolism, the kind of energy that was required. And so the point of this figure is that from this period all the way to this period here, the only thing that was on the planet was microbial life forms. And all that diversity we see in the tree is kind of a reflection of that, that incomprehensible time frame of geologic time, which is hard for a person to get a, their mind around of, of, of the, the numbers of, of the, the amount of time that goes through at this point, since humans only showed up a few seconds before midnight on this clock here. Okay. And so I, I, I think this, this um, figure embodies a lot of what we're trying to say. I mean, it's, a, it's actually quite much more complex when you try to think about uh, you know, everything that's gone on and all the evolution that's happened uh, during this time. And so that's sort of the setting for why this is a microbial planet and why we're also, every life form on the planet is so dependent on microorganisms and all the, the biogeochemistry, all the weathering that happens to all the, the minerals in the surface um, are really uh, acted on by the microorganisms and they're everywhere, they're found everywhere. And so uh, over the last 20 years, I've spent a lot of time putting dirt in a bottle. 
And so, um, and it's been a lot of fun. It's been so much fun, and I just want to keep doing it. You go to some interesting place. So for me, it's been contaminated sites. Contaminated sites are wonderfully wonderful places for finding microorganisms because they've been historically contaminated, usually for 50 or 100 years with a whole mishmash of things. And then you go and you try and see, well, what, how these organisms have, have, how have they adapted to that environment? What is what's happening? And so. Uh, I've focused a lot on these anaerobic processes because in the subsurface, especially a contaminated subsurface, it becomes anaerobic very quickly. Oxygen is so poorly soluble in water, gets depleted readily, and and uh, and so you know what happens. And the questions that were asked, uh, that we were asking you know, some 20 years ago, was, well, if there's no oxygen, the common microbiological sense was you needed oxygen to get toluene to degrade, for example, because that's that's because that toluene's kind of reduced and it's stable and all that kind of thing, and hydrocarbons are stable. But that's been disproven. I mean, it's not true. You don't. Uh, you can uh, oxidize hydrocarbons anaerobically. Okay. And so, uh, so that was where I started off. And then when I started working in consulting, the big problem was chlorinated solvents. That was the. That was everywhere uh, in in um, in all the sites we were looking at. And, and it was known that these things can dechlorinate, and especially under anox environments, they can dechlorinate. And so we got some dirt from chlorinated solvent contaminated sites, put it in a bottle, kept out the oxygen, tested a number of different conditions of electron donors and electron acceptors, either i.e. food sources and, and what, what we could do to stimulate dechlorination, and ultimately came um, to realize that you could completely dechlorinate trichloroethene via the dichloroethene, the mono, monochloroethene <coughs> vinyl chloride, and it was a, a breakthrough in a laboratory in Cornell studying their anaerobic digester that found that, hey, you know what, even vinyl chloride, this toxic monomer, could be dechlorinated to ethene, and ethene is actually a fruit ripe, ripening hormone. It's why your peaches all ripe at the same time, ripen at the same time in your basket. Um, and so ethene is harmless. And so, wow, if we could actually stimulate this in situ, we have a way of detoxifying these kinds of, of, these kinds of compounds. And so, um, fast forward now, I mean, we started working on this uh, 20 years ago, and, and uh, a lot of other researchers as well, and what has been discovered is a whole new microbial group. They're now called organohalide respiring bacteria. These organisms use these relatively oxidized compounds, because the chlorine group tends to it basically pulls electrons away from the carbon, makes these relatively more oxidized. This is a reductive process. Um, and these microorganisms have evolved to use these uh, compounds um, just like we use oxygen in their metabolism. And so uh, they also are very interesting. This organism here is called Dehylobacter restrictus. It was the first one that was actually isolated, or a microbe that was isolated that that grew on tetrachloroethene, PCE, and that's the only thing they could find that it would grow on. They couldn't find it would use anything else. It wouldn't use oxygen, it wouldn't use nitrate, it wouldn't use sulfate, it wouldn't use any other electron acceptor you could give it. It uses hydrogen and PCE, and that's how it grows. So it was called dehylobacter, because it's a bact bacter means bacillus, like that shape, and because it removes halogens, and it was called restrictus, because that's all it could do. And um, a whole bunch of other organisms have now been identified and, and the ones that can do this really key detoxification step here are from this genus called Dehylococoides, because they have this sort of coccoid shape, sort of. Uh, and it turns out that that's all they do is remove halogens from organic molecules. That they are obligate dehalogenating microorganisms. And so when you, so then this was some, some years ago when we started realizing this, we didn't actually have names for all these organisms, but we had bottles of dirt that did things, you know, that degraded, and, and, this, and, and we thought, wow, you know, if, if this is really so specific, maybe there's a business. And so my colleagues, um, at the time they were at Beat Consultants, but now they're at Geosyntec, um, Dave Major, he said, I think there's a business here. We could inoculate sites. And we'd done studies in bottles and in, 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 in uh, microcosms where sometimes you wouldn't get, the dechlorination would stop somewhere along here, and then we'd take in another bottle where the dechlorination was going all the way to ethene very actively, we'd mix the two bottles, and lo and behold, then the, the bottle that was stalled would go. And so we recognized it was a microbial process, we recognized that you, it wasn't uh, inhibited by anything in, intrinsically in the site, and so we, we, um, we started a company. And so we started a company called Serum, uh, it's in Guelph, and we uh, basically grow up the culture. We called it KB1 for kick butt, 
because it went so quickly and actually, anyway, this is a long story. I can tell you that story <laughs> another time. But, um, but uh, the neat thing about it is, okay, so it, it, you can take, you can grow up this culture, you have to grow it up anaerobically and so, kind of like a beer keg kind of thing and you inject it in the ground and it stimulates complete dechlorination of, uh, of, of chlorinated solvents. And uh, by understanding the microorganisms within it, this is the dehylococoides, it's a really tiny, tiny cell. You miss it and most, you can't, it's 500 um, nanometers in diameter and it's just tiny. Um, and then, but we, but by understanding a bit of the genetics and genomics of it, you can actually create markers to, to track it in the environment and figure out where it is. And so now you can go to a site and figure out if you have resident microbes that are doing the job or not and decide whether or not you need to bio-augment. And so the company has done well. It was 10 years ago it was founded, and actually 2002 it was founded, and, and it's still going well, so more than 10 years. They've uh, uh, used it at more than 400 sites around the world. And, um, uh, and now we're looking at, looking at different kinds of contaminants, alternative, you know, additional contaminants that one can use in the same kind of strategy. So just to recap, you know, the idea of dirt in a bottle to a commercial process, okay, this happened in this case, but the the, this, this kind of dirt in a bottle, the commercial process was happening and, and many people around the world were finding, oh yeah, you know, it really does work. And then um, through the advent of, of, of um, better techniques to look at microbial communities because dehelicocoides is this organism that uses hydrogen and, and TCE, but it needs hydrogen. Where does it get the hydrogen from? It gets the hydrogen from fermenting some cheap electron donor. So just like we can ferment to make whiskey or ferment to, to make, to, to make um, other things, uh, yogurt or whatever, you can provide a cheap electron donor that ferments to hydrogen and you have to provide that in situ, okay? And so, and, but it works really well. So we've understood a lot more by doing uh, this sort of iterative process of, of, of growing the cultures in the lab, studying their genomes, their, 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 their genetic makeup, um, tracking these organisms because it's really hard to do that. They don't, you can't, they don't stand out like a cow or a moose or something. It's harder to see. You have to track them using these molecular tools developing these molecular tools and then working with uh, companies that are injecting these, doing field um, campaigns and so on. <coughs> and it has, it's still going strong and it's been really a lot of fun. But the basic thing is back to this metabolism, which is that these organisms use hydrogen as their electron donor and they use the chlorinated solvent as their electron acceptor. Okay? And they've evolved because there are actually, when you go out and look in the environment, um, hundreds of thousands of naturally occurring halogenated organics in the environment, believe it or not. Chloroform is one, uh, bromoform, these things are produced by reactions that are in rocks um, and uh, with salts, right? And that's where you get them. So organics and salts and, and a little bit of energy somehow. So we've extended this notion to lots of different environments um, over the years. And so I talked about hydrocarbons, and looking at hydrocarbon contamination in all kinds of contaminated sites. We're also very interested in, in, in looking at microbes, and not just we, but the whole planet is interested in, in biomass conversion. How could we harness you know, cellulosic biomass to make biofuels or things like that? So we've looked at the moose rumen, because they eat a lot of um, cellulosic material, beavers, because we thought these were like iconic Canadian uh, <laughs> things. So we got beaver droppings and moose rumen fluid from one of our students who was a hunter. And, uh, and have taken their gut contents and, 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 and enriching for um, cellulosic uh, uh, fermentation reactions. Uh, we're working a lot with the pulp and paper industry, trying to understand anaerobic digestion of pulp mill waste, um, or, um, acid condensates, things like that that are actually rocket fuel for, for, for methanogens, and then recycling that energy back into the plant. Um, and so, obviously, biological wastewater treatment that you're all familiar with, are there ways we can do this better? It's a lot of energy in there to add oxygen, and, uh, and then you make a lot of biomass and you have to deal with the solids. And so is there a way to look at, the, rethink a bit wastewater treatment? Um, and then uh, the acid mine drainage problem that, that, that is also a microbially driven process in the environment. Is there a way to harness those microbes to, to, um, to help rather than to cause a, a, a liability? And so on, along those lines, a few years ago, Vlad approached me and, uh, and said, well, we're working on this bio-leach mechanism. We've got these um, um, pyrotite tailings, and we have these other kinds of tailings. They still have a little bit of nickel in them. Is there any way we could enhance this leaching process? And, and so, uh, so we started to work on that, and I kind of applied the same 
simple concept, which is, well, let's just get dirt and put it in a bottle and see what happens. And, um, and so we did a little bit of this, but just the idea would, you know, is that this, this, these oxidation reactions and the, and the uh, oxidation of iron and the oxidation of sulfur uh, can be catal catalyzed chemically, but it can also be catalyzed biologically, that microorganisms can live and pH 0 0.5 is, is quite remarkable um, and, and thrive in these low pHs. And so uh, understanding this acid production and all these different steps and which parts are, are biotic and which parts are abiotic and which way, which way we can get this synergy to go um, uh, is an, a long, um, has been around for a long time. The concept has been long for, uh, around for a long time, but I think the tools are way better now for looking at this and, and much more specifically and figuring out you know, which <coughs> organisms are actually doing it. There's the, the culprits that people have heard about, but there's lots of other organisms out there. So again, the whole concept here in, in, leaching, in the leaching side of things is these organisms use reduced compounds like H2S or iron uh, or ferrous iron, elemental sulfur as the electron donors, okay, and oxidize the electron acceptors, okay, and so there's enough energy there and the, that's, what the, that, what, that's what drives the metabolism. You can even uh, figure out that, if, that nitrate can be an oxidant for iron oxidation and there are organisms that can oxidize sulfur and oxidize iron with nitrate as an electron acceptor. There's advantages and disadvantages for these things, these different oxidants and the different um, electron acceptors as I like to call them uh, with respect to pH and redox <coughs> and things like that and how much, they, how much acid or base uh, they consume or generate in, in the different processes. So we started two, um, what did I do? Oh yeah, so this is my basic method. If energy is released, then microbes can grow. I should say it another way. If there is a potential, and microbes have found that niche, and they're there, okay, is the way to think about it. And, uh, and so we started these two uh, bioleaching pro projects, one with pyrotite um, and uh, an acidic bioleaching, and the idea there was to try and get very high solids con content to make it kind of economically potentially feasible. Uh, and, and looking at under different, uh, at under ac acidic conditions. Uh, and another one where it's an uh, ultramafic, and so we th the idea of maybe, I, I put it to Vlad, maybe we could try nitrate, so he humored me. Um, and so the concept was, uh, again, the same thing, going to a site, various sites, collecting samples, putting them in bottles, incubating aerobically and anaerobically, and, and at higher and higher concentrations, trying to enrich for the microbes that are there um, and, uh, and then characterize them. And so proof of concept, I mean, uh, this is known. It, it does work. You can leach, uh, you can acid leach these kinds of tailings, uh, these tails, and you get nickel to come out. Um, you know, the, the, the what is the nature of the reactor? What are the nature of the conditions that are needed to make this work best? Uh, you know, how does one take the best of the chemical and biological reactions and, and, and put it to work for us. And these are things that we need to continue. Uh, on, the, on the nitrate side, so there, are, there is an organism that's been characterized called Thiobacillus denitrificans, which does this coupling of sulfur oxidation and iron oxidation to nitrate reduction. And the original thought that I had was that this doesn't, it actually consumes acid, it doesn't actually produce acid. And so, uh, and it, this is, uh, happens around circumneutral pH as opposed to acidic pHs. And so uh, this was a thought. And so we set up some bottles, uh, same thing, dirt from a site uh, with the pentlandite. Uh, and, and, um, and sure enough, you do get lots of iron oxidation, lots of sulfide oxidation, um, and uh, nitrate reduction, and a little bit of nickel leaching. So we got a little bit of nickel extraction and not a whole lot, but partly it's because we're operating at pH 6, and so it's not sure to, the solubilities, you have to play around with the solubilities, and I suspect that we could do better at different pHs at a slightly lower pH. So these are just initial projects, little, and Vlad can speak more to some of these, uh, 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 but, the, but what would I would really love, or what we all really, really love, is some ideas of a good problem one could think, sink our teeth into. Um, and, and do uh, try to un understand the microbes that are doing it. And the reason is, is that if you just look under the microscope, you know, microbial populations like this, and you have no idea what these rods are doing in these and what the different, you just don't know. But if you take this same sample and you extract, the, the, you can 
filter it and extract all the DNA from all these different microorganisms that are in there. You can sort out the sequences of those D that DNA and figure out which organisms are where. And then if you have a process or bottles, dirt, dirt in a bottle, and you vary the conditions, you can see which microorganisms go increase and decrease under what conditions and, and, and get it function that way. And so that's sort of the whole uh, idea behind this uh, environmental metagenomics, as it's called. Metagenomics just means that you're not isolating that one curly corkscrew organism first and then extracting its DNA, but you're, you're just doing the whole thing together, the whole pile together, and then sorting it out and sequencing the DNA, the genomes of the DNA that's inside each of these different cell types, okay? And from that DNA or the corresponding um, messenger RNA that, it, that comes from this, which is basically those parts of the DNA, parts of the genome that are being used at that time, uh, we can determine who's there and, and how they're active, and with a bit more experimentation, we can figure out how. And once you figure out how and, 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 the, and the constraints on it and the conditions that, that enable it, you, we can design processes to best use those, those properties. Okay. And so I'm just about done. Uh, this is just a, a very quick uh, example from those uh, pentlandite samples where um, under aerobic conditions and denitrifying conditions, and all the colors mean, these are just triplicates, what the colors mean are diff different types of organisms in the samples after two years of growing it on that m mineral, on that ore, and then on, on, uh, under nitrate or, or aerobic conditions. And the main um, uh, take home message here is that yes, thiobacillus is what we might expect to find in these kinds of things, and we do, but when you look under nitrate reducing conditions, you actually, it's, it's a much lower, you find other iron and sulfur oxidizers, and you find lots of different kinds. And so, just because somebody described 30 years ago one kind of organism um, and that their properties, there's so many uh, variants thereof. And, and some of these variants might have the selectivity or might have the activity that would just work really well. Much like uh, some variants of dehelicocoides are very good at vinyl chloride, but not all. Okay? And so, I, I think that's the take home message is there are, there's, 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 microbes out there that can do wonderful things if there's a energy to be gained. It has to have, it can't defy the laws of physics, but it's there. And we just need to um, uh, have clever ways, uh, culturing methods or, or sample sites to find them. This is a picture of um, microbes attacking a piece of wood. Okay, and, and, and if you uh, apply genomics, then you actually can identify who, who's what which one's doing which, so I just put color on here. But the, the point being is also, it's not usually one microbe, it's usually a consortium of microbes that really works um, uh, to do these things. And so um, that's why we need to, uh, to look at these things as a team of organisms as opposed to single ones. And so I'd like to conclude with this, which is um, Werner Stroom, who was an aqueous um, chemist, not at all a microbiologist uh, and very prescient. Um, stated that microbes are the best chemists in the world, so maybe we have, we can learn from them. So. Okay, I will pass it over to Leslie, and uh, so.